Hello, everybody. Welcome to our series here on Esoteric Atlanta called Understanding the Magdalene. We just finished our first book in the series last week, which was Mary Magdalene Revealed, The First Apostle, Her Feminist Gospel, and the Christianity We Haven't Tried Yet by Megan Watterson. For those that joined us for this book, you know that that was an emotional roller coaster of just yumminess going through Mary Magdalene's own gospel. And of course, experiences in dialogue and commentary by the author Megan Watterson. If you missed that series, I will put a link to it down in the description box below. Now, the second book that we're going to be starting today is a book called The Magdalene Manuscript. This came recommended to me. This is going to go through the alchemies of Horus and the sex magic of Isis. And so this book is probably going to get a little bit interesting and a little bit spicy. Now, I don't know what to expect with this book. I know some things about what were channeled through this manuscript, but I don't know at all. So just like our Megan Watterson book, I am reading this with you guys for the very, very first time. So any reactions that you see me have are genuine reactions. Now, again, if you don't have this book and you would like to purchase a copy of this book, so you have your own copy to read through, I will put a link to that in the description box below. But as always, it's not necessary to actually purchase these books because I am going to be reading through them. All right, for today, for the first day, we're just going to start with the invocation of the cosmic mother. And then we're going to read through the male, Tom's introduction to this channeled book and then we're going to read through the female who is judy's introduction to this manuscript and the next next week we will actually get into the channeling from mary magdalene herself invocation of the cosmic mother oh great mother divine feminine birther of the cosmos lover unto spirit creatrix of all matter and queen of all worlds within worlds and those without we call you to us in this hour. We are your children. Hear our call. We are the daughters and sons of your divine union, the flesh of your passion for life. You who lay with spirit, our father, in the beginning of time and brought us forth from the blessed union of spirit and matter. We are your children, the sons and daughters of your flesh and your heart. We remember your touch and the fragrance of your essence, and we long for you. Come to our hearts and gift us the remembering. Come to our minds and open our genius. Enlighten us with your presence. Draw back the veils that we might see and hearken the doors to open. What beauty and ecstasy may live in our homes and hearts more fully. This is our hour of greatest need. We call you through fire and water, through earth and wind, through all that bears your name. We call all your lineages and your name. Come unto us, come into us, so be it. Tom's introduction to the Magdalene Manuscript. Personally, I have tremendous challenges with this manuscript. For one, it is channeled. And I thought that I had left that kind of writing behind me after, after I finished the Hathor material. For me, channeling is a questionable activity. It reminds me of the sin nets people cast in the waterways of the Camerou in southern France, an area believed by many to be where Magdalene came ashore. Along the banks, large nets sit in the river. Occasionally, someone cranks a hoist and pulls the net out of the water to see what got caught. I think channeling is a lot like this. There are currents within our psyche. They carry the hodgepodge of things, some of them interesting, some of them worthless, and some of them downright strange. Sometimes the channeling net catches something of unquestionable value, but often it is mixed with a bunch of junk. My first experiencing with channeling was in the late 70s. A friend of mine happened to be a medical researcher at Duke University, and we conducted a series of informal experiments on the phenomenon. Since I worked with hypnosis in my psychotherapy practice, we decided to see what might emerge from hypnotic states in relation to channeled material. That very first evening, we made contact with an immense intelligence that we euphysmically called the big dude. I have quite an irrelevant streak, and anyone who knows me will attest to this. Big dude spoke in characteristically grand style, typical of channeled ent entities of intelligence. It spoke about possible earth changes, and it spoke about the interconnectedness of the universe. 
While the transcripts of the talks were intriguing, both my friend and I agreed that there was nothing of real substance. And after three months of meeting once every two weeks or so, we dropped the experiment. As a psychotherapist working in the area of transpersonal psychology for many years, I have seen a lot of clients who channeled. Some of them were quite comfortable with it. Some were quite disturbed by it, like a woman in her late 40s who was awakened at three every morning for the last year. She would sit, pen in hand, and scribble out messages from the other side. The other side of what is the question? Her transcripts talked about the power of love to heal. Sometimes they offered some decent solutions to problems. Sometimes, quite frankly, they said very strange things. Strange is, of course, a relative term. What is strange to one person may seem quite reasonable to another. The cultural filters we use to sieve our experiences are often arbitrary and based on inherited nonsense. My task as a psychotherapist was to help my channeling client make sense out of their transpersonal babble. I use these words on purpose. The collective unconscious is filled with all sorts of things. The psychological entities that reside there are varied, like the characters in real life. Some of these denizens from the collective are brilliant and well-intentioned. Some of them are idiots masquerading as spiritual beings. There's a tremendous increase in channeling among both laypersons and professionals alike. I think it is just a sign that as a collective, we are beginning to gain access to our psychological and spiritual depths. Many people are having spiritual emergencies in which their views of the world are quickly and radically altered by peak spiritual experiences. I think a lot of us have had that happen to us. I believe that we will be seeing even more of these psycho-spiritual experiences crises over the next several decades as new mythos within our collective mind begin to surface. Channeling within this context is nothing more than a message from the deep. But like the summer fishing holes of my youth, some of the things down there are not worth fishing for. But still they come to the surface of the mind like an old shoe or a rusted beer can. One of the tasks for anyone faced with channeling is to separate the valuable from the inane the uplifting from the dangerous. Just because the information is coming from the other side should not imbue it with any more authority than the words from someone down the street agreed. In fact, when someone hands me something and tells me that it was channeled, my guard goes up. And when a being from the other world shows up on my doorstep, so to speak, I look for logical inconsistencies. I lay traps. If they pass these tests, I am more likely to consider what they are telling me but I am the final judge. If what they say does not make sense to me, I dismiss it. Which is super, super, super important to do. Absolutely. And so in the midst of my immense resistance to the channeling phenomenon, Magdalene showed up one night in Zurich, Switzerland. My partner, Judy, had asked me to see if I could get anything about the Magdalene since we were shortly going to be in Sainte Marie de la Mer, the site of Magdalene supposedly landed after the crucifixion. I closed my eyes and entered a light hypnotic trance. Immediately, a being appeared in my mind's eye and announced that she was Magdalene herself. She began to dictate the manuscript you now hold in your hands. Over many sessions, she spoke with undeniable clarity and urgency. Every word was precise, and the feeling in the room during these sessions was electric. Now, several months later, as I look at the manuscript with a critical eye, I am struck by several things. The first is a personal dread at adding to the glut of channeled books. That's the last thing any of us need, I tell myself. But the material is like nothing I've ever seen. As a student of internal alchemies for over three decades, I have been fascinated by the similarities as well as the differences between the world's alchemical traditions. I have made it one of my personal quests to experience a vast array of alchemical methods for transforming and elevating consciousness. From this perspective, the techniques offered by the Magdalene are quite extraordinary. As a spiritual pragmatist, I have always tried everything myself. If it works, I keep it. If it doesn't, I toss it out. I have personally used the techniques Magdalene describes, and they work. They work extraordinarily well. In fact, I can honestly say that practicing them has enhanced all my other alchemical practices, regardless of the lineage from which they come. All of this led me to one final logical conclusion. 
for those fellow students of alchemy, for those seeking deeper experiences of spiritual transformation, and for those who desire sacred relationships, this material may well prove invaluable. For this reason, I have decided to release the manuscript. There are still some problems for me. I'm a stickler for accuracy, and there is no way to verify if the story is true or not. There are many versions of the Magdalene legend, and it happened so long ago, I suspect we will never know for sure, at least from an objective point of view. I found the story Magdalene painted during the sessions extremely evocative. Parts of it I still do. However, the bulk of the story is to me just another story. Could be true, could be false. As a person firmly anchored, some would say marooned, on the shore of logic, I can't say whether the story is true or not, and this disturbs me. But I can say that the methods she shared and the insights she offers are extraordinary. And so, for me, I sorted through the manuscript. I put the story back in the river and kept the methods. I asked you to do the same. Read this with your own heart and mind. Keep what is valuable for you and leave the rest. I realize that this book may very well be controversial in many circles. Still, I think it's right to release this manuscript into the world. If it does nothing more than get us to question the various issues it brings up, then I think the book's existence will be justified. It is, after all, a time for all Christendom to question its misappropriation of the feminine. For those seeking a deeper understanding of inner alchemy as means of transformed consciousness, I believe the material unquestionably stands on its own. During my rereading of the manuscript, a funny thing happened. So get this. Here I was looking at the material with a rational and critical mind. As I considered whether to publish it or not, Isis appears to me. Yes, Isis. She asked me to finish the book as soon as possible. What's a guy to do? And so this brings us to his partner, Judy's introduction to the Magdalene Manuscript. It was a chilly night hung with heavy fog in Zurich, Switzerland. We had a splendid dinner at our favorite Thai restaurant next door to the Allstadt Hotel. We had time on our hands. It was a rare window in our lives. It was Thursday, November 30th, 2000, 22 years ago. I had a growing passion for the Magdalene, both an archetype and the Magdalene, the being. Who was she really? So much we live with every day in the civilization is based upon the church's branding of her and ergo all the feminine as whores, as shameful. Because of this branding, no less than holding down divinity and burning a hot iron into her flesh, the feminine has carried shame and has been held as less than for over 2,000 years. There is absolutely no basis for the church labeling her as a whore. Not one word from its original text supports such accusations. It was, in fact, the Council of Nicaea, huge subject we've talked about on this channel, under orders from Emperor Constantine that chose the prostitute spin to support the patriarchy despite the authority of the feminine, shame all that is feminine, and unite the many diverse religions in the popular upstart religion called Christianity, all for the sake of Rome, for the sake of government. Again, guys, if you are still under the impression that Constantine was a great guy, then that is some heavy cognitive dissonance. We have evidential facts to prove that Constantine was, in fact, a Satanist and a psychopath. He was not a good guy. Their grounds for branding Mary Magdalene a whore? Jealousy and fear of the power of the feminine, especially the kind of power that Magdalene had. I have never believed that we were born in sin, and I have never believed that Mary Magdalene, hence all the women in her steed, were whores. And I have never bought the image of Jesus Christ as a pious, celibate, holier-than-thou, fanatic, evangelical. Me too. I have never bought that about him either. I had followed the trail of Magdalene through southern France years before, and I wanted to take Tom on the same route my heart had found to retrace my steps with my beloved. But I was afraid to trust my own heart, and I desperately wanted more background. I wanted the story. I wanted more than the story. I wanted the truth. I remember telling Tom that I would only consider validity in the story he brought through because I so value his integrity and his ability to contact true source. And so I asked him if he'd ever consider contacting her. 
Now I need to tell you that Tom does not like to channel. The scientist and the mystic do frequently battle internally, and I love them both equally. So I usually stand back and watch the scientist ultimately yield to the sweet light of truth that the mystic can invoke. And in the dance that prevails, in the end, the world is presented great teachings, cloaked in the veil of science, the ignorant of this time demand. So be it. But for this night, for whatever reason, Grace was standing by and she was on my side. I asked if he would consider trying to contact Mary Magdalene. And he said yes. When, I held my breath. How about now? He lay back on the bed and I grabbed the laptop. He quickly moved aside and the Hathors came to assist by adjusting his neurology, which they frequently do to quiet the scientist who protest too much. And she entered. The room swelled with power and an intensity of electricity that I felt in my fingertips. My fingers trembled on the keys when she began to speak. It was all of the eternity reached out and closed the gap of time. She was there. We were there. The hourglass cracked and time suspended. I hope I never forget hearing her words. I swear I will never forget to be grateful for her truth, for Tom's open heart, for Yahshua's honor, and for the trust that she extended to me in telling me her story. She continued over a period of weeks as we traveled through Switzerland, the Italian Alps, and down across Tuscany. She came through on a boat from Genoa, Italy, to P Palermo, Sicily. And when Sicily turned out not to be where we were meant to winter, she visited us on the boat from Livorno to Malta. She continued on Outish, the smaller island of Malta, oddly enough, within sight of where she landed to reprovision on her trip from Egypt to France. She uttered the words, we are complete, just before Christmas of 2000. Every night before she began, she made me read back what I had taken down from the previous visit. She corrected any words I hadn't gotten correctly and altered an occasional word clarifying here and there. And before she left us each night, she asked me to read back what she'd given that night. Many nights she waited at a particularly poignant junction in her story while Tom emotionally experienced her story as she told it, emitting moans and little whispers. She would say to me, this channel is feeling the emotions of what I am telling you. My heart goes out to Tom that he felt, even for a moment, what it must have been like for her to love a man as she loved Yahshua and to lose him to death for the sake of all humankind. And my heart goes out to Yahshua. Only now, after hearing and knowing her story is truth. He loved her so. He almost didn't do what he came to do. We left Malta in the spring. The computers were safely packed and shipped home. I hand carried a disc with the manuscript on it with me everywhere, along with a hard copy. Thus Magdalene went with us into Russia, the Ukraine, back to Germany and Switzerland and Vienzia, and, when it, and then it landed, so to speak, back in Saint Marie de la Mar, where she landed in southern France. The disc and the hard copy waited patiently in my suitcase while we toured the Rennes Le Chateau and imagined how the pyramids must have looked when she dared to brave the wilds of, the, of those majestic peaks. And finally, at our tiny apartment overlooking the Mediterranean, on the island of Paros, she came back once more to answer more questions about specific words in the manuscript. Until we received her permission, we did not change one single word, not even a simple and obvious change in tense. She thanked us for our impeccability. I figured if the ignorance we've had to live with for 2,000 years was a result of someone editing Yahshua words badly, I wanted to do my best to see that no one could possibly misunderstand what she was saying now in setting the story straight. I asked her several personal questions that I knew someone would ask when we presented this manuscript. I know the questions some of you hold in your heart, and I asked her what to say to you when you ask those questions. Frequently she said, tell them Mary Magdalene has no comment. The questions she did answer are in the last section at the back of the book. She spoke about the critical importance of this manuscript and its significance in the return to, of the Cosmic Mother. She said, for the whole of the earth, for the galaxy, for the universe, and those continuous. She said she would call people to this truth from all over the world, and those who were ready would find the manuscript one way or another. She congratulates you for hearing the call, and she thanks you from the bottom of our heart on her behalf and on behalf of the Cosmic Mother for being here.
She says nothing will ever be the same.